Good. Okay, so um, welcome again um, to uh, the CMPT 898. Um, uh, I had noted that uh, we uh, were building on our discussion from last time on Troy of Abstraction Chapter 8, but also um, I sought to suggest that um, we would also uh, take on Chapter 9 of that book because it uh, discusses um, examples that are, are useful, I think, for, for discussion here. Um, and I think, you know, they're, they'll be instructive through the main purpose of these sessions um, following chapter eight, which is to really talk about categories of relevance to, uh, to the theme of the course of so application of category theory to dynamic modeling, particularly for, for health modeling. Um, so, um, uh, just wanted to uh, first reflect on um, the fact that we're uh, we're talking about the basics of categories. Um, we talked last time about some of their the major elements that go into their definition. Um, and does anyone remember those three sort of major um, types of of uh, components of the formal definition of categories? What what did those three components involve? It's on page 102. Well, the three major components are the components that Eugenia Chang, the, the author of Joy of Abstraction terms data, which are information about what two things, what two things are included in the data, information about the what and the what. The uh, objects and the arrows. The objects and the arrows, or, or the latter often called morphisms. That's right. Um, and um, the objects are often of, of much less interest per se, it's the network of relations in which a net, uh, an object is embedded. Um, it's incoming arrows. It's outgoing arrows. It's it, that they really define the role it plays in the category. And so the objects um, are, are are. It's not fruitful to think about the objects typically as as like themselves composite elements that that have you know, elements inside them or something. We, we abstract away from that. They're sort of points, um, indivisible points almost. Um, and, uh, and so we have these objects and then we have these arrows that sort of define the role that they play in the category. Um, um, we have um, these arrows, as I say, coming in, arrows going out. And those arrows kind of tell us how that object relates to other other objects, right? It, it places it in context. It's this web of relationships. And I use the analogy, you know, just as they say, the way you really know a person is by looking at the company that they keep. The way you really know how an object functions, what it what role it plays, what, you know, um, what what its function within the category is is by looking at the arrows around it. But beyond the data, um, and and I, I would note, like system science, in system science, it's not the pieces; it's their interconnection, right? It's the relationship between the pieces that is of foremost interest. Um, and there's kind of a, a a very, you know, similar philosophy at work here. But beyond data. There's the structure, and structure consists of what two things? You remember? Identities and composition. All right, identities and composition, and and I mean, from a system science, I think of this as as kind of getting at the emergent features of this category because um, 
you know, we can specify the that that there are arrows from A to B and B to C, et cetera. Um, you know, A to B and B to C, but that doesn't tell us really per se how those just just knowing that there are arrows in these Hom sets, these sets of arrows between A and B include these arrows, and these sets of um, arrows between B and C consist of these arrows, the so-called Hom sets, the sets of arrows between a pair of objects. That doesn't, that doesn't really tell you about the relationship of the arrows to each other. And it's really when we get into identities and composition that we're dealing with this you know, this question about how those arrows compose end on end, two arrows end on end, you know, compose to, 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 to indicate, you know, to be the same as uh, another arrow. And uh, this is extremely important um, for understanding the structure of a category, kind of the rules of engagement of that, that category. Um, now, sometimes it's for for some of the categories you can be excused for for thinking that it's rather uninteresting. Um, so we have these categories that are so-called free orders, or in some cases full orders, like this one, um, where we um, where we have a thin category, what's called a thin category. And does anyone remember what what was kind of the the essence of what it meant to be a thin category between any two pair of objects? There is what? How many arrows? Exactly one. Exactly one or or zero or zero. Yeah, like between four and thirty here. There's no arrow, right? Um, or between um between um two and uh one three there's no arrow but there's either one or zero arrows here no this is important because in a way composition is trivial here um which two arrows like you 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 could be excused for saying well well, I mean, really, what does composition give you? I mean, if you if you know there's an error from two to six here, and an error from six to thirty here, I mean, there, there's really no choice. Then that composes to be the single arrow. There is an arrow, and there's a single one from two to thirty. There's really no choice in the matter, right? It, composition is, as we say, trivial. I mean. It, if if there is an arrow from A to B and an arrow from B to C, then there is the arrow from A to C, and and composition doesn't really tell us, you know, um, interesting new information about which arrow. By contrast, so so that's true of these thin categories that that kind of composition is kind of trivial. Um, it tells you that there is an arrow from A to C, but there's really no choice about which one it is. It's the only one there can be. Um, but when it comes to, um, well, I, yeah, yeah. So, so that's, that's, I think, fair to say. But when it comes to categories in general, um, there's a lot to say. Um, and some of the categories we saw um, even last time um, really do like composition tells you the structure of the situation. Like if you if you compose A and B and B and C, the rules of composition dictate what is A to C, which of the many arrows. And and maybe a prototypical one before I come to this would be this category of sets and functions that we talked about last time. Do you remember this where we had functions? So each object here is a particular set. And a an arrow from one object to another. So that's each object. This is that, and, and the arrow from object A to object B. What does the arrow represent? It represents a what? A function. A function. 
from this set to the target set, right? And it says for each of these values in the source set, it has to specify one and exactly one value to which that value is mapped in the target set, right? So maybe 2.3 goes to false and maybe 4.78 goes to true and minus 4.1 goes to false. That would be an example of a function, right? Um, is negative is a, is a function, right? It maps 2.3 here to, to false, 4.78 to false minus 4.1 to true, right? So here, each object is a set. Each arrow is a, it's a particular function, but function. the way I've shown this, I'm only drawing one. I, ha I happen to only draw one arrow from this set, 2.3, 4.78, and minus 4.1 to this set, false and true. Tell me, is that because there is only one arrow from this set to this set, from the you know the set associated with this object to the set associated with that? Is there only one arrow, or are there many arrows? There are many, many. There are many arrows. Are there infinitely many though? To be infinite. from this particular set. Remember, it's for this particular set. How many functions? How many different functions are there from from this to this? How many different ways could this map onto that? I think it could be infinite, like depending on what your like morphism is, because. You can do is negative or is positive, but you could also do something like is uh, less than 0 0.0001. That's and true. then you can, you can argue that you can do that with infinite amount of potential numbers and whatnot, but they'd all be part of this same sort of homomorphism idea from what I think. Well, well remember a fun, okay. So this is a great discussion. I love talking about this, but Nastaran, were you gonna say something? I guess uh, six uh, function could be. Okay, I love. I, I guess love... six. Uh, I mean six factor factorial. Uh, okay. Or... Uh, a. Uh, uh -huh. and, uh, no, no. Two, a, two, a, uh, a, pardon me. Two. Uh, on uh, two uh, power uh, six. A A power B. Then uh, you want to uh, uh, you want to uh, count the function from A to B. Uh, become b uh, power a that but is correct. i think that uh, is correct uh, and let, let's I, yeah uh -huh. and uh, uh, i think about uh, it it depends on uh, associativity how about the way that uh, you want to have a group in the uh, in the um, uh, composition well here there's really does... no there's really no for this arrow from this set to this set, it turns out there are eight functions. That's all, only eight from this set to this set. So we could enumerate them. One would be this, this, and this all go to false, right? That's one. Yeah. The, the next would be this, this go to false, and this one goes to true. The next one will be, let's say, I'm, I'm picking arbitrary order, but there could be another one where this maps to false, this one maps to true, and the next one maps to false. The next one could be this one maps to false, this one maps to true, this one maps to true. I don't know if you could see what I'm doing, but I'm counting up in binary what each of these things could map to, right? This could map to 0, 0, 001, it could map, to, or sorry, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, sorry, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. One zero zero, one zero one, one one zero, and one one one, and there's exactly eight such functions. There, there, there's no, no, no. It's true, and 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 this is really a nice thing to discuss that that you could say. Well, the underlying rule gives the same behavior, you know, like like uh, maybe the underlying rule says. Uh, I don't know if if it's um, less than uh, zero, um, we'll make it uh, true, and otherwise we'll make it false. Um, that would give the same behavior for this particular set as one that said if it's less than point, you know, zero zero one, um, uh, it it will give the same behavior. But 
mathematically, it turns out the, the mapping performed from this set to this particular set is the same. It's the an identical mathematical mapping that this one goes to false, this one goes to false, this one goes to true. And yes, you could write code that encodes that with, you know, different particular rules that all happen to yield that answer for this particular set. But it turns out mathematically, we're not talking about code here, we're talking about mathematically, those are the same function. It's kind of like from the standpoint of encapsulation, the standpoint of abstraction, where we don't look inside that code, they perform the same mapping. They perform this mapping of say, 2.3 to false, 4.78 to false, minus 4.1 to true. And yes, we could write code that, that you know, compares it against zero, compares it against 0 0.001, 0 .001 against minus 0 0.001. We could write code that it's a loop from zero to one at first, and then returns that a loop from zero to two first, and then returns that we could write lots of code that looks different but mathematically, it is the same mapping for this to this. Um, there is only eight such observable mappings. Like, like it goes to for all of these, it's false. For all of these, it's true. For you know, the first two, it's false, and then this is true. And and I listed them out. It's really, you know, it's like listing again zero, for each of these whether it maps to zero or one which is really two to the three power. Mm -hmm. um, it's like it's like for each of the inputs, we either have zero or one. And so you have, you know, two times two times two. One each has two possibilities. Does it go to zero or one? And it, it, whether this one goes to zero or one doesn't constrain whether this one does or not. So it's not a factorial. A factorial you'll get into like, if the first one goes to it, you can't do the second one to it. But here it's just, this could go to either zero or one, this could go to either zero or one, this could go to either zero or one, and therefore it's eight. Are you comfortable with that? Are, are people comfortable with that, that notion? Anyone want to talk more about that? So I, I want to highlight though. Oh, sorry, was there a question? Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question. Uh, this uh, this uh, number of functions is mm -hmm. mathematically and um, but if uh, thinking uh, mm -hmm. if uh, we don't think uh, mathematically because uh, this is a formula in mathematics a power b okay. Yeah. If we don't know uh, this uh, this formula, and if we if we don't think mathematically, and uh, if we think about uh, in think the another way, we can say okay, uh, there are many functions from a uh, to b uh, because the functions are different, and we have uh, the many types of functions. Well, but uh, again, speaking of the mathematical definition of a function, which is category theory is a mathematics, is a mathematics. Um, you know, it says a function is defined by for every possible input. Here we have the possible inputs. It's either this or this or this. We specify one and exactly one value to which it maps. That completely defines a function. Um, we're not talking about functions in Java, which can touch, you know, static variables of the class around them, or like, you know, functions in C, which could, you know, have a have a loop with before, you know, before they return their value or or, or whatever. It's like, you no, know, we're talking about the mathematical function mapping one set to another. There's there's when you have a set B, or or I'll I'll just say when you map a set A to a set B, the number of possible values of the the number of possible functions, if if you have 
you know, is the number of elements in B to the power of number of elements of, of A. Because for each A, oh, for each A, each possible value of A, you have B possible things to which it can map. So you have B times B times B times however many things there are in A and possible values. You know, B times B times B times, you know, B number of different things. And so if there's three things in A and two things in B, you have two times two times two. If there were four things, there were four possible values in A, then it'll be two times two times two times two, because each of them can be mapped to that. And that's what we mean by a function in, um, in, in mathematical terms. And it's that we're dealing with here. Um, so, so you could talk about functions in programming, but that's really a kind of pun on the word. It's, it's, it's kind of function-like, in the sense it's like a mathematical function, sort of, kind of. But um, when, when we talk about functions, you know, in, in programming languages, often we're thinking about a more sort of, um, not strictly a mathematical definition of art. We're thinking about a programming construct that, you know, can have side effects or it can, it, it can do, um, it can manipulate the, 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 the fields in the class in which it's defined as a method or, or, or what have you. It can, you know, it can print things out on the screen. It can send a message, you know, via email. It could, um, it could, you know, crash or whatever, right? You know, it could hang. And it turns out category theory is going to have nice descriptions of all of these. But we have to distinguish between the categorical and, and, and mathematical notion of a function, which is what, what is here, versus the programming language kind of sort of like concept of a function. When we say function in each of those domains, we mean something different. There's some, you know, kind of uh, similarity and in, in kind of um, at, at a certain high level of, 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 of sort of um, notion. Uh, there, there's some motivation behind it that has some similar elements, but we have to realize they're different and respect them as different things. And this, here we're dealing with functions. And the reward for that is, if we can be firm about this, one of the big rewards is we're going to be able to do all sorts of amazing things, including describing this more, this other notion of functions in C or Java or whatever. All those will fall out, but we have to be clear what definition of function we're doing. And I'm adhering here to a mathematical definition of function, which, by the way, happens to be the notion of function that you find in functional programming languages right. like yeah. Haskell, like scheme like common list and, and, and etc um those notions of, of functions yeah um, yeah. um with an asterisk that um uh as to to in scala yeah we can we could do it in scala exactly and and yeah. there's a reason for that it's not giving something up it's getting more it's actually getting more like you could do more much more powerful things if you would if you have that notion um you you get something in return and that's what we're going to see in category theory so here we're doing with the category sets of functions we're dealing with functions as defined in mathematics i hope that's helpful yeah, yeah tony were you going to yeah. say something um i, I just going to say that like uh every function here should be a morphism right so every function what... here is a morphism yeah every function from one set to another set is a morphism that's right that's right. Uh, what what if I have a function that map a set to itself, for example, a Q function uh, on the set of real? Is yeah. that how is uh, identity morphism? Uh, well, an identity morphism would map like each of these. You may remember, and this is the other component of the structure component of categories, right? When you define categories at page one hundred two. The other component is identities. And each object has to have, must have, an identity morphism. And that identity morphism here is an identity what? What are all the morphisms here? They are, begins with F. Functions. Functions. So it's an identity function. What is an identity function from 
2.3, sorry, from this set to itself, what would it do? What would an identity morphism do here? It would do what? It would it map 2.3 map... to what? 2.3. I'm darn right. And it would map 4.78 to what? Uh, 1.78. To 4.78. And minus 4.1, we map to what? Minus 4.1. Good. Yes. Now, it is that the, is that exactly every every element of the set? These happen to be sets. Every element we map to itself, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, um, are there other functions mathematically? Are there other functions that map from this set to it to map from this set to itself that are not identity? Yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> there's one function that would map. Give me one function. Give me one other function that's not the identity. 2.3 maps to 4.78, 2 point, or 4.78 maps to 4.78, negative 4.1 maps to 4.78. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, that's I, another function. Yeah. Uh, I, I get that. I try to get to the point that because you say they're from, from the set on the top to the yeah. true and false, yeah. they're exactly a function, a function mapping to them, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and how many I, functions I just, are there from this to itself? Uh, there. In seven. I could say three, infinite. Three to the three. Three to the three. Uh, no, no, three to the three. Three, uh, three, three to power the third. three. Yeah, because this could go to any of these three. This could go to any of these three. This could go to any of these three. So there are three times three times three. 27. Functions. There are 27 functions. Three to the third power. That's how many functions there are. You know, all I could list them out again, oh, right? I see. All of these go to this to to 2.3, you know, or all of these go to 4. Point, minus 4.1, all of these go to 4.78, or or all of these go to 2.3, you know, or the first two go to minus 4.1, the next one goes to 4.78. You know, we could just list them out combinatorially and there'd be 27 of them because each of these could go to any of the three when it maps to itself. But one of those functions is the special function. One of them is the what? Identity. Identity function. Identity. And that always exists. Okay, always exists. So there's an identity function here. And there's, a, and there's, there's so, so there's 27 functions from this to itself. How many functions are there from this to itself? Uh, cool. Two power two. Two to the power two, which is four, right? Yeah. Right? The, 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 right? Both of these map to false. Both of these map to true. The first maps to false and the next maps to true, or the first maps to true and the next maps to false, right? Like there's there's only four functions. Do you see that? Okay, now, you know, there's, there's more over. Only so many, I didn't write out what set this was, so there's only so many functions here. By the way, this, this says is negative, but it really is negative applied to this particular set, right? It's like is negative for this particular set. It's not the general is negative. It's like is negative for this particular set. Anyway, um, uh, but the point is like the composition rule tells us how to compose any arrows that are back to back, right? Um, and so it'll, say how to compose like when i compose a particular arrow from here to here and a particular arrow from here to here which particular arrow do i get from this guy to this guy right because there might be many many in general there will be many many arrows from this guy to this guy which one of them is the composition of a particular arrow here and a particular arrow there that's encoded by the composition rule that's the structure that's the structure and by the way, it encodes that when you compose an identity, say the identity from, from this set, 2.3, 4.78 minus 4.1 to itself, if you compose that with this um, um, with this function, well, um, hey, come on. Uh, um, uh, when you compose that identity with this guy, you get with any particular function here, what, what do you get in return? If, uh, sorry, what do you get? So if you have one identity function here and you know the, the specific identity function here, 
composed with this, a particular function from, call it F, from this object to this object, what do you get back? Just F. F, right. And when you compose F with the identity function from this to this, what do you get back? F. 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 Itself. Itself, yeah. So this is all part of structure. Structure tells you like which things compose to be what other things. We could enumerate, you know, in the first part of this, the data, we could list out all the functions from this to this. It's just some set. It's called the HOM set of this comma this, right? Um, um, and we could list all the functions from this to this. It's just a HOM set of this to this. But the composition rule tells you when you compose a particular function F with a particular function G, which function do you get? Which particular function of all the functions from this guy to this guy, which one do you get? Do you get that? Yeah, so that's that's why we say it encodes structure. It's like this emergent structure it tells us how to combine things to get something bigger, how to generate the next thing, right? Um, from what you've got, what does it generate when you compose it? Do you, do you understand that? You appreciate why that encodes kind of the rules of engagement with this? It's like, it could be a different category for, or a different rule for for what thing composes with what thing to yield the results. Um, so that's good. And then what, what's the third? Well, anyone have a question on that before we go on to the third component of the definition of the category 102? Page before you log, can I ask, um, am, yeah. I, am I right to think then that the only possible way, at least in this category, to have infinite morphisms is for one of the sets to be infinite? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's the only way you're going to get you're you're going to get b to the power a. That's the, remember where that comes from. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Each of these gets mapped to b possible things. So we've got a of them. So b to the possible a to be infinite. It's got to be that either b is infinite or b is more than one and a is infinite. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it, um, that's right. So so one of those has to be infinite. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. For for this category, the category of sets and functions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And by the way, there's a there's a much more nice, well behaved one called fin set, where it's actually these are all finite sets and it's it's functions between finite sets. And that makes heads hurt less. You, know, you don't have to deal with infinite, but it rules out things like R plus and Z and N. What why do I say that? Why are why are these not in fin set? Like why is this what does this denote? It denotes what? All natural numbers. Yeah, mm. so they're infinite. Yeah, and there's an infinite number of them. So so this is not fin set. Fin set is a really nice fin set will be our delight. Um fin set will let us think through these things with extra clarity and fin set will be so useful practically. And we use it all the time when writing code in CatLab, as you will do, because it is your destiny. Okay. Um, okay. So moving right along. Um, <coughs> so properties, ladies and gentlemen, properties. That's the third component. And what do properties include? By the way, there's a nice little thing which I have to credit I, from this universe, from this uh, we can, that shows kind of a mapping from one set to another. But what are what are the properties? They include what? Well, it includes the unit laws. Um, uh, yeah, the the unit Not laws. Cheek. Yeah, and it includes associativity. That it has to be the case. You don't have any choice on that. It has to be the case. The composition is what? Is associative and associative. Okay. Now, um, there are plenty of types of composition that are not associative, especially not associative on the nose. But but we're dealing here with composition that has to be associative. Don't worry, we'll we'll get to later get to be able to deal with non-associativity and things, that kind of messiness, but we'll deal with it in a very principled way by, by establishing a well-founded foundation 
where we have associativity obtained holding. Um, by having that guaranteed here, um, we'll be able to build a really nice structure that will handle all these funky other needs um, uh, in beautiful ways, in really consistent ways. But associativity says that if we put what? What does associativity say? Well, you can kind of read the, the rules off, right? Uh huh. If we have three but, arrows, uh, uh huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in composition, I think uh, when we have a chain of morphism, yeah. Uh, when uh, we want to um, a way that we want to group them. Yeah, yeah. So it says, um, look, that's right. So it says if you do cube. And then the ceiling of the cube. So if you start with one of the elements of this set and you do a cube of it, and then you do a ceiling of it, and then you do abs, it's the same as as doing what? Well, it's the same as composing ceiling and abs. So in other words, composing these two and then applying abs um, to map it to this, it's the same as composing these two doing a cube and then applying that comp composite of, of those two, right? That's what that kind of rule rule says. You know, we can either compose these two, get a composition of them, and then, you know, apply mapping with that and then do abs on the results. Or we could, we could do this first and then compose these two and, and, and get something from this to this and apply that, right? Either one, it has to yield the same thing. And you'll see there's a lot of cases where this is the case, actually. Um, like if we compose, if we concatenate one string, foo, with another string, bar, with another string, baz, we, we put them end to end to get out foo, bar, baz. Does it matter whether we first concatenate foo and bar? And then stick bass at the end versus if we compat concatenate bar and baz and then stick foo in front of it. Does it matter? Or you know, stick that at the end of foo? Does it matter? No, because the final string is the same no matter how you have those intermediate strings while you're building it. Exactly. Yeah. If we add two to three to four. Um, you know, is if if we first do the first two, two or three, right? And we get five, and then we add four. Is that different than instead doing three and four first, and then adding two? No, it's it's no different, right? Um, both cases it yields nine. Both cases it yields nine. Adding two first, you know, and then three, and then getting five, and then four is nine, or you know, adding three and four first, mm -hmm. getting seven, and then having two add to it. It's the same thing, nine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so, so there's a lot of cases where 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 associativity does hurt. It holds for a lot of cases. Yes, no, no. Mm -hmm. well, uh, I generally can we say uh, the the resulting of uh, this composition is the um, same uh, regard, regardless of mapping. Well, we what we say is that it doesn't matter where the parentheses go. When you write down, if you have three morphisms in a row, F, G, and H, it doesn't matter. It doesn't where the parentheses go. If if it's F and G then composed with H, or if it's F composed with G and H. It doesn't matter where the parentheses it doesn't, it doesn't yeah. matter. It's unambiguous either way. You, you know exactly what it means. There's no wondering, oh, you know, which do you have to do first? No, 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 it's the same. You don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. Um and sometimes it's trivial, right? Sometimes you have this sort of thing. And there's no question it because there's only one. There's only one between these ones. So it's there's no question that they're different. 
No, it's the same function each time, right? Or same, it's not a function, sorry. Same morphism each time, regardless of whether you go, you know, uh, one to five to 10 to 30, um, or you go, um, uh, sorry, ah, uh, you, you compose these two first, you get something for one to 10, and then you do this one, or you do this one, and then you compose those two. It doesn't matter because there's only one morphism from this one to this one, because this is a what category? Begins with T, ends with N. Thin. Yeah, it's a thin category. There's only one path from each object, you know, from one or zero paths from between any two pair of objects. So, so it's automatically the case that that um, associativity holds. It, it, and same thing with with this guy. Associativity holds. You know, you go this guy and this guy and then this guy. You know, it's gonna be it's gonna be the same whether you sort of do these two to get a composite here and then and, and and have that after this one or whether you do this and uh, sorry this this you know compose these two here and get to this and then do it with that it it it's going to be the same because there's only one morphism from here to here um uh so yeah of course it's the same no matter which way you go it it's always given to the same result um but in other cases it, it really does mean like here there's a lot of functions between sets uh, it's a lot of in fact it's as we'll see like sets and functions is like incredibly like it's huge numbers of functions it's, it's huge numbers of functions between these things um uh and set plays a special role a, a very nice role in category theory because it's it has so much flexibility there's not a lot of structure here the, these things don't don't actually have all that much structure they're just bags of bags of possibilities and so there's there's very little structure and and it turns out that's going to when, it, when you deal with things like free monoids and so on, this is going to really come up. It's like sets uh, have have all this flexibility um, to them. They don't have a lot of structure, like a stock and flow diagram would have, or like a mon like a like a petri net would have, or or whatever. Like a like uh, these these categories where each each object, you know, there's there's a lot of structure that constrain. The morphism, the homomorphisms between them. Okay, so we've talked about some of these rules and categories, and I, I, I realized last time when we were together, we didn't introduce another category. Task. Task is a category of great significance to us as computer scientists, um, and you could think of there being a corresponding category for Scala, for example. Um, although Scala. Scala um, allows some extra choices. A lot of the time we use Scala in a kind of functional object oriented way. I mean, it, it has, it has, it's a functional, it can be used as a functional programming language with subtyping, um, which is, is really nice. Um, uh, you have some similar ideas in Haskell. Um, and, uh, and so when we use it that way, we, we get similar categories. So here, just to stretch your mind, I'm trying to get you out of thinking all categories have sets. No, 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 no. Like this, this doesn't have any. Like this doesn't have sets. These are just numbers and a, you know, morphism from A to B means A divides B, right? Um, here, morphism from A to B means A is less than or equal to B. Um, you know, they happen to be sets, but it's what do these arrows represent? Can you read it off? What do these arrows represent? This is these are post sets, partially ordered sets. What do these represent? Is a subset? Subset, yeah, yeah. Include it, not necessarily proper. So it could be that's the same set, but because there needs to be a morphism from itself to itself, right? If 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 this said it, an arrow from A to B means A is a proper subset of B, would that be a category? Uh, no, because then there's no identities. There's no identity morphism. Yeah, um, uh, that's right. So, so we've seen sets and functions, but get a load of this. So this is a category for a Hask. 
Um, these are types. Mm -hmm. Float to int. Mm -hmm. So these things between them are functions. Mapping from guess what? So what do you think these functions are? I've only driven, I've only drawn one, but I can assure you there's a lot more than one of them. And what do, what do you think these are? Anyone? A, a, a function, these, these morphisms, the elements of the HOM set from object float to object int, guess what they are? Functions? From what? From... Uh, from between different types, so for example, yeah. from float to int? Yeah, from floats to ints. Mm? Mm. Input output. Yeah, yeah. Input. functions from floating point, from float, that's a type in Haskell. It's a corresponding type also in Scala to ints. Mm? Do you think there's just one of them going between these two? No, there's infinite because ah, float. Infinite. Oh no, they're not infinite because they're not in because they're the float has a finite it's value. Pretty, yeah. It's pretty pretty. Yeah, that's right. It's yeah, from from the standpoint of kind of an engineer, yeah, it's pretty close to infinity, right? Because like it's like the number of possible ints to the power of the number of possible floats, right? That's that's pretty darn big. Um, but yeah, technically it's not infinite, right? Um, or these are functions from what to what? Functions that go from the take a what is input. They take uh, these functions here, take a and what integers, an integer, and it maps it to a what? A boolean to a yeah, false? Maps it to a boolean. Yeah, exactly. So give me one such function. Give me. Give me one stinking such function. What, what would it be? Give me just give me one arbitrary function. Is even? Yeah, is even. Great. Give me another one. How about a close cut? It's not even. It's not even. Good. Yeah. Or is odd, right? Is yeah. positive. Yeah, is positive. It's another great one. Right. Is negative. It's another. Could you give me a particularly trivial one? False, right? It, it, whatever you give it as an int, it returns what? False, right? Another one is you give it whatever int, it returns what? True, right? Those are functions mapping ints to bools. They're, they're kind of particularly simple ones, right? Like whatever you give it, it says false. <laughs> um, but is it a function for each value? It gives it a Boolean? Is that a function? Yes. Yes, it's a function. Yeah. There's a lot of these functions. A lot of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's How about float and of... double. What's that? Float and double. Yeah, float, float, and double. Yeah. Um I, I didn't happen to draw it that way, but you know, uh, there's another no, one. This float float. Double. Um uh, this orange float. Um uh oh that's okay. Yeah. Well, what does this represent? Anyone? Um, anyone recognize what these brackets represent? Bracket. Uh, integer. Array. No, it's an array uh, of, or a vector of floats mapping to doubles. So what, give me one function from an array of floats to double. What, what would you? Yeah, it would sum them up and, and treat it as a double, right? What's another one? It would sum only the even numbers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Another one would just return 0, 0.0, right? Another one returns 3.1415926. Yeah. Um, uh, another one would return minus one. Like those are function. Another one would multiply all the values in the vector given to it. Another one would sum up their square roots. And, or sorry, to sum up their squares and take the square root of it. It'll be like a, a norm, a L2 norm of it, right? Um, these are all like functions from this to this. So this is a this is a category with a lot of functions from each one, right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's a nice category. It turns out like we can reason about Haskell in terms of this. Now, it turns out there's some there's some flies in the ointment. And the main the main one is functions in Haskell don't always return. Like it might hang, right? It might not return. Uh, like it might be in an infinite loop. And it turns out we can deal with that in a separate way, but we need a rock solid foundation. And that's the foundation of the Sadeyofa category on page 102. And we'll get to how we can handle non-termination, et cetera. Um, um, in, 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 you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later, how it returns bottom, um, et cetera. But it, um, we'll, we'll, we'll give some, some comments on that. But, you know, we can build up this foundation, you know, categories involve a kind of well-defined, just like with equivalence relations, we lay down certain rules for it to be nice, um, but they were a bit too restrictive because they had symmetry. Here we've relaxed some of those rules and we're having relaxed rules we capture in a category, okay? Um, and that's what we have here. Um, so this is, is Hask. Um, we have morphisms, so we have composition of morphisms. You compose one of these to one of these, you get something going from float to bool, which hopefully makes sense based on your thinking from this, right? If we have a map, if we can map from a float to an int, we have some function that maps from floats to ints, and then we have another one that maps from ints to bools, then we can compose them. It makes sense, right? You, you kind of do the first one and then you do the second one based on the results of the first one. It can go from float to bool. So each pair of particular functions one from float to int, another one into bool. You give me a pair, one of the first and one of the second, a particular function f and a particular function g, I can give you back g after f, the, the composition of those, or equally f big semicolon g, and that will be a function from float to bool. Does that make sense? Some kind of make sense? Are people kind of feeling a little bit comfortable with this notion? You may feel it's unnecessarily restrictive, but believe me, it, it turns out like this is enough power to get us into orbit. And then we can all, all sorts of amazing things with this. This is well-defined enough, structured enough, kind of well-behaved enough, we can get into orbit. Um, but once we're there, we can do all sorts of neat things because we, you know, we don't have to deal with with pesky gravity or something like that. It's not a perfect analogy, but um, hope you'll you'll tolerate the the failing of mine. Um, so, our, our, so I I hope you you get a sense that okay, there are these different categories, and as we'll see with with uh, stock and flow diagrams, um, we will end up having ways of encoding them. And in general, when we're dealing with categories, we may have multiple things that compose to the same value. I told you the composition rule, which is indicated here with um, with fat, fat arrow, this means, remember, A circle D would mean A after D. This A fat semi D means D after A. Okay, so first you do A, then you do D. And hopefully your exposure to programming languages will give you in kind of a, make that kind of familiar territory because we deal with semicolons between statements all the time in programming languages, right? So it's like D after A, right? We do A first, see this? Oh, sorry, hey, get back there. A and then D. Now, what this is saying is, well, you tell me what this is saying. What, what is this? What is this saying here? So th this is like a category. This is, this is a presentation of a category, and this is saying something about the composition rule. When you compose one thing, it tells you about when you compose different things how they relate to one another. So what is this guy saying? 
it's saying that if you use A, then D, or if you use B, then E, or if you use C, then F, you'll end up at the same yeah. object it's, dot it, at the end. It, well, it actually says more than that. You're very close. Excellent answer. But it actually says this is the same morphism. Any of these gives the same morphism. Remember, composing C and F gives a morphism, right? Like you have this morphism and then you have that morphism. When you compose them, you get another morphism, right? If you have morphism from A to B, or sorry, I'll call it from X to Y and Y to Z, when you compose those morphisms, you get a morphism from what? X to Z, right? And and here we go. That's so, so yeah. So we have well, okay. This isn't actually associativity. It's just telling you the composite. It's telling you something about the composition rule. It's saying that if you compose these two morphisms, you get the same what? The exact same, same morphism. The exact mm -hmm. same morphism, composite morphism from this guy to this guy, this this object to this object as you would get if you compose this to this, that those yield the same composite morphism. So does that mean that all the three dots in the middle must be equal then? No, no, it doesn't, it doesn't. It just says, remember when you go from, uh, like these could all be, these are all in general different objects, these could be different objects. But remember when you compose something from X to Y and Y to Z, you get a morphism from X to Z. This is going, and, and I, I won't use X and Y now. I'll, I'll say if you have a morphism from you know, P um, or, or morphism from P to Q and Q to R, you get a morphism from P to R. Right? P to R. Um, and, and it turns out that, oh, P to R here is, you know, those, those are P and R are the same objects as, as X and Y, right? Oh, I, I, I screwed that up. I should have, that's just confusing the way I phrased that. If you have a morphism from X to Y and Y to Z and you compose them, you get a morphism from X to Z, right? From, from here to here, right? In, in general, you compose end to end arrows, you get a morphism kind of from the to end to the end, right? So, so um, X to Y, if you have a morphism from X to Y and a morphism from Y to Z, you get a morphism from X to Z. If you have a morphism from X to, call it P, and a morphism from P to Z, and you compose them, you get a morphism from where to where. From X to P and P to Z, you get a morphism, you compose those, you get a morphism from what? X to Z. X to Z. And it, so what this is saying is, it's the same morphism. And guess what? In category theory, this is going to be saying these commute. So no matter which way you go around here, these yield the same morphism. This is going to be like one of the most pronounced features of reasoning categorically, because there's going to be all these diagrams where the multiple paths from one object to another object commute, meaning it doesn't matter which way you go, you get the same result. You get the same composite result from this to this. This, it doesn't mean that these intermediate objects are the same. It's just when you compose this morphism to this and this to this, you know, X to Y and Y to Z, and you get a morphism from X to Z, it's the same composite morphism you get when you go this way. It doesn't matter which way you go to get here. Mm -hmm. um, when you go this way, call it X to P and P to Z. You, you get a morphism from X to Z that happens to be the same one as here and happens to be the same one as there. This this will be like a doubling commuting thing. And it'll, this triangle will commute, meaning no matter which way you go, it'll be the same, same value. And no matter which way you go this way, it'll be the same value. And Nona, a couple sessions ago, noted, for example, similar properties when you have the Manhattan metric, right? Getting from one point to another. Do you remember that taxi cab metric? What did that say? If I wanna, if I'm in a grid pattern, like in Manhattan, in city of New York, and I wanna go from point A to point B, 
Do you remember the thing, the property about the distance there? I can either go this way or I can go that way. And guess what? How do those distances Euclid. relate to one another? No, no? Euclidean. Yeah, well, it's not it's non-Euclidean metric. I, I'm going on taxi cab distance. Oh, taxi cab. Yeah. And and how do oh, those uh, at the uh, uh, triangle? Well, uh, okay, but but those distances. If I go from, if I go from one point, say, Columbia University to to Times Square, and I go this way and then down versus this way and then over. Those distances on a Manhattan metric, on a taxi cab metric, or on a grid, what are those? How do those distances compare to one another? They are. They're the same. They're the same. same. And, and and so that's going to have a very similar property. No matter how you get from A to B on that grid, for example, is going to be the same distance. It doesn't matter whether you go one way or the other. And, and there's many physical systems where this is true, right? Where you have, you know, a, a conservative, what's called a conservative field. I'm not talking about GOP candidates. I'm talking about like um, the conservative field is where like... So go from A to B, it doesn't matter if I go one way or the other, I expend the same energy. Um, the different ways I go, it's the same energy I expend. There's many physical systems like this. Um, so, so this is going to be called commuting. And particularly this is saying this, this triangle commutes because D after A is the same as E after B. They compose to be the same thing. It doesn't matter if you go this way or this way. It's the same. It's kind of saying like um, these things yield the same same results. And these things compose yield the same results. This, this is going to be a very important feature of reasoning categorically because a lot of the time we're going to come up with commuting squares. It doesn't matter whether we go this way or whether we go that way. We get to the same destination with the same composite. So remember, composite rules tell us when you compose two things, what you get as the result. What's the, if we compose this one with this one, what's the particular arrow from the source to the final destination? What's the particular arrow? And this is saying it has this particularly nice property. You go this way, you get the same arrow as a composite as you go this way the same these things composed to be the same same value it's just a more particular morphism from here to here and it happens to be the same if you go this way or this way and that's super nice property it will turn does that make sense what i'm saying yeah okay. different so ways yeah oh sorry different ways can uh, can give us uh, this same target yeah and a lot of the time they will when it's a nice behaved nice nicely behaved situation they will often give us that and it's a beautiful property beautiful but someone else is going to say something too yeah is this universal like the fact that that equation is there on the bottom is that oh, no. them telling us about a special no or... this is, they're just showing you here like um one particular example this is called a presentation of a category you know f is not particular some particular thing but a category could have this property Okay. Some, yeah. Some categories will, some won't. Um, when they have this structure, there's ooh, there's some nice structure there. Ooh, ooh, that's that's kind of that's kind of nifty. That's kind of um, a sweet. If if you have this structure, it's like wow. Oh, that's pretty interesting. No matter how I get from here to here, it doesn't matter, right? The the end result is the same. That's pretty cool as structure. That encodes some structural properties about this category that many categories won't have. It's it's not like this has to hold all the time. No, 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 no. It's just it is kind of nice when it does. Tell me, does that does that structure hold for a category like this? Yeah. That no matter how you go from you know one up to zero, one, two, three, you get if you compose those paths, those those arrows, you get the same. Morphism from one to one, two, three, zero, one, two, three. Yes, it does. It's yeah, it's the same property. 
because there's only one such morphism going from this to this. It's a particularly trivial case. Um, it's a particularly trivial case, but it, but it, it 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 does hold. Yeah. Um, so uh, there are there are cases uh, where that holds. Does it hold here? With this sort of sort of category, I mean, I, I'm not saying we have to do it for thirty. It's a bit contrived to say it starts at one, but um, does it also hold for this one? Yeah, it does. It's a thin category. There's only one such thing from here to here. So, you know, if if you go to a path to all of this, it has to compose to some morphism from the source of that path to the end of that path, and there's only one such morphism. <laughs> There's a path from, from here to here. No matter which way you go, it has to be the same morphism from the source to the destination. For here, does it hold? That, that you know, well, there's only one such path, so it's not particularly interesting, right? Um, but yeah, in general, it will, um, in general, it won't hold, but it's beautiful when it does hold. Mm -hmm. um, uh, beautiful when it does hold. Um, does it does it hold here? No matter which way we go, from from this category to this category, uh, to, to, oh, sorry, from this object, this set to this set, does it matter which way we go? If we go this way, we pick any two morphisms and compose them this way, and any two morphisms, you know, composing it this way, does it? Does it always yield the same result? No. No. Uh, no. No, there's a lot of different morphism. It's not, it, it doesn't have much structure at all. It, it's very flexible and loosey goosey and, and, and can do, you can, you can get to this in a lot of different functions. <laughs> you can get to this in a lot of different functions. They're not always the same. Um, and it's not, not always the same here. Um, now, we're, we're running out of time here. I, I have a stiff constraint I mentioned because I got to get to a, a train. Um, I have got to catch a train. Um, but chapter nine, we'll, we'll expand on next time. Um, um, we have factors and number systems and equivalence relations. And here, Eugenia Chang is brilliantly drawing back the curtain because a lot of the examples we've seen earlier, these examples of rotation and symmetries, right? Section 9.1, um, uh, examples with equivalence relations, um, section 9.2. It's factors, factors of 30. Um, oh, factors of 30. Um, uh, 9.3, number systems, uh, where we have one thing less than or equal to it, shown here, for example. Um, all of those are examples of what? The point is that of chapter nine, all of those are examples of what? Of? In categories? Of categories. Categories, they're all examples of categories. And, and, and I love the way she's introducing it because these are, you know, the, we, we commonly would think of these as such very different sorts of things. Rotations, shapes, we have factors of numbers, we have like orders on numbers, one thing is less than another, we have, I'll include here, set inclusion, right, subsets, and and, and we're going to have schemas and blah, blah, blah. Um, we're Haskell and, you know, these relationships between sets. So all fit into this picture of categories. Categories, of, and, and it can handle vastly more than that. I mean, this is just kind of a smattering of particularly simple foundational ones. Now, these ones happen to be really useful ones. They're not... They're not just the white elephants of it, you know, that well, they're not just like any arbitrary thing that we'll never we'll we'll never remember again. You know, they're not just toys that we'll forget about because they're 
they're they're just too arbitrary. No, 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 no. no these are we'll come back to these quite a lot. We'll come back to these. They're great for intuitions, but they're also great because they are super important sets and functions. Well, we'll, we'll be spending all sorts of time on that, and it's and it's better behave relative or nice relative fin set. This quasi category of Hask turns out is really really useful when thinking about programming or software engineering applications of categories um and you know things like pre-orders these sort of things these are useful kind of devices to think about useful things to think about um these subsets yeah that will come up uh, a fair bit etc but um these are all different facets of category hood Mm -hmm. sort of categoriness um, uh, and categorical properties. Um, and uh, yeah, she um, she introduces these and reveals all these things she was talking about earlier can actually fit into this categorical framework. Okay. Um, are you folks comfortable with that? Yeah, thank you. Okay. And it's really good. Now, again, I would talk more, but I've got a train to catch. And if I miss it, I'm in a bit of trouble because it'll be really, really late. So um, I think what I'd like to, like to suggest is we go on to chapter 10 um, for Thursday, and I'll be there in person. You know, um, the US government didn't shut down. <laughs> um, so it turns out <laughs> I can fly back tomorrow. It's kind of nice. Um, it's super important to me and to Narcissus for her defense. But um, these sets, um, uh, these ordered sets, we'll be talking about in in chapter ten. So I'd like you to to read about this. I don't think there's going to be a lot of surprises. Um, and she'll fit those into the this categorical framework um, in these. These orderings, upsets, partial orderings, I'm sorry, partial orderings like this, where you can have two things, you know, that aren't related at all, but there's some ordering structure by which this is kind of in some sense less than this, and this is less than this, in a sense, this is less than this, but this has no relation. It's not the case that this is less than when I say less, I mean less than or equal to, you know, this or this one is less than or equal to that. By the way, I'm playing a bit fast and loose by referring less than and equal to here be set inclusion, right? That it's a subset. And this isn't a subset of that, and this isn't a subset of that. That's okay. That's a partial order. This, uh, this is a total order. Any two things, either A is less than or equal to B, or B is less than or equal to A. Hmm. Um. So we'll see these next time, okay? My my sincere regrets. Um, I've got to pack up here at Mass General Hospital and puff it to North Station um, before before this uh, train departs. So uh, apologies for not being able to dwell longer. Uh, it's great to be able to see you here. Hope you've um, uh, enjoyed this despite its remote character. And I will see you two days from now in person in uh, 125. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Azad. Uh, as I said before, I will be, uh, I uh, will uh, participate in the uh, next uh, session. Yep. In uh, Edmonton. Yeah. Edmonton. Yeah, yeah. Thank awesome. You. Sounds good. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for letting me know. Great to see everyone. Take care there. Stay safe. And I'll see you shortly back in sunny Saskatoon. Take care there. Thank you. Okay. Safe trip. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Take care.